Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Faith. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Welcome to part 3 in our series, Amazing Grace. And today will be the last message, I believe, in this series. I'm sure we'll never fully get rid of dealing with the subject of grace. It's just too much there. But I believe today's the last message for this. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Received a phone call from a brother the other, yesterday, and he had just discovered the book of Ephesians, and he was so excited. And uh, I was smiling like, yep, awesome book. So he had read chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6, and he thought, maybe we ought to go back and read chapters 1 and 2 and see what it has to say. And he was some kind of excited, hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. You ready? Good deal. But God, who is rich in mercy... For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What a powerful section of Scripture. Amen. Hallelujah. Grace, as we've said, is the beginning of our faith. It is the origin of everything in the Christian life. <clears throat> I have a, a first point here that... I believe is important. It's a simple point, but it's important for us. That is, there is an abundance of grace available to you. There is an abundance of grace available to you. You will never run out of the grace you need with God as your source. Just never going to run out. You cannot run out of the grace of healing. You cannot run out of the grace of prosperity, the grace of peace and joy. You cannot run out of the grace of God. You cannot run out of the grace of healing. You can't run out of the grace of God for anything in God. God's grace is not limited, it is limitless. And I want to drive home this first point for, for a reason I so want to honor my pastor and my pastors and the churches I grew up in, especially the main one. But there were some things that they just didn't know, some things that they didn't, they didn't see, and we had some religion in our church. And they so preached sin every week. It was just such a sin, sin, sin. You better not sin, and it, it just made you feel beat up and so condemned. We were le left with a very strong impression that if I just mess up one more time, I have forfeited the grace of God. I have sinned one too many times, one too many times, and I've just, God's grace is done, it's over with, and I've blown it one too many times. And so we, we lived in this atmosphere of guilt and condemnation. We lived on pins and needles, watching every move and, and second-guessing everything we ever did. But I want you to know today that according to this passage here, God's grace will never run out for you. It's going to take the ages to come for Him to show us how much grace he has. And I know that there are some pastors who would say, Phil, you can't teach your congregation that because you're going to give them a license to sin. They're just going to go out and sin wholesale because the grace of God will cover it. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I, I believe with all my heart that every true born-again child of God is not looking for a way to sin and get away with it. They're looking for a way to get out of sin. Their heart, they love God with all their heart, and they're not looking to get away with stuff. They're looking to get into God closer than ever before and be like Him. So I'm not concerned in sharing with you that you can't sin beyond God's grace. You can't. I don't believe you can. Now you can harden your heart and run away from God, but His grace is still there. Your grace is not going to tap out His... Pardon me, your sin is not going to tap out His grace. His grace is not limited, it is limitless. It's good to know the next time you're healing that God has grace for you for that area. Amen? Amen? I'm so thankful for His grace. According to what we looked at last week, 
In Titus, the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. So the more grace you have, the more you're going to have the ability to live right and live a life pleasing to the Lord. As we've said in this series, grace is the power to live the truth. Right? So when you sin, when you mess up, don't condemn yourself. Go boldly to the throne of grace, receive mercy, and obtain grace to help in time of need. Right? One of the things that I have learned is that when I sin and I mess up, when I go to God and ask for forgiveness, I pray something additional. According to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, I ask Jesus to restore to me my sense of righteousness. Because if I receive His ministry of, of my propitiation and He restores my sense of righteousness... I'm not going to go around the rest of the day or the rest of the week feeling defeated and broke down and I'm so no good and I'm so unworthy and man, what kind of pastor am I? I, I pass all that up because I find Jesus restoring to me my sense, of unri- of my sense of righteousness. By His blood, all unrighteousness is cleansed and by His present day ministry, He restores back to me my sense of righteousness. So I highly recommend that when you sin, and hopefully it's not often, you go for farther lengths of time without sinning. But when you do, when you repent, do more than that. Receive the ministry of Jesus and have him restore to you that sense of righteousness. It doesn't honor God. It doesn't please him for you to go around feeling guilty because you messed up. Amen. Amen. That's the devil giving you a one-two punch is what that is. So God's grace is not limited. It is limitless. If you're concerned about sinning beyond God's grace, that's a lie of the enemy. I'll take an amen right there. It's a lie of the enemy. His grace is so abundant, it's going to take the ages to come to reveal it to us. My, my, my. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, please. As you turn to 2 Corinthians, could you please say, God has an abundance of grace for me. Second Corinthians chapter six, Psalm one hundred five verse twenty. <laughs> People are not going to understand that, are they? Second Corinthians chapter six, verse one. We then, <clears throat> excuse me, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, this is not a contradiction contradiction to my first point about his grace is abundant. It is. It is limitless. But he's talking here about receiving God's grace in vain. How, how do you do that? How do you receive God's grace in vain? Hope you have your toes stepped out there so I can step on them today. You waste God's grace when you become impatient and try to make things happen yourself. Anybody guilty besides Phil Flynn? You waste God's grace when you become impatient and try to make things happen yourself. You waste God's grace when you become impatient and try to make things happen yourself. I believe every Christian's probably been guilty of that at least once, maybe twice. This is how we receive God's grace in vain. We waste it when we become impatient and try to make things happen yourself. When we get to heaven, I think for most Christians, they're going to say, God, we have one question for you. Why did it take so long? Why weren't you on our time schedule? Right? That's probably our our number one question. And then when we talk to him, we're going to go, well, thank you for not going on our time schedule. Thank you for keeping to yours because you're wisdom. Right? Now, keeping with this, this flow here of, the vain, receiving God's grace in vain and wasting it because you're trying to do it on your own. With that thought in mind, go with me to Galatians 3 and verse 3. Galatians 3 and 3. What a, what a verse of scripture here. Galatians 3 and 3. 
book of Galatians will always hold a special place in my heart. It's the first book I ever studied all the way through from verse to verse. Galatians 3.3, 3, are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Ouch. Ouch. Whenever you feel the temptation to start doing things in your own strength, begin to praise God. Yeah. Yeah. That will really stop that temptation. Whenever you feel the temptation to start doing things in your own strength, just begin praising God. Don't waste His grace. You can stay in faith, you can stay in grace, and you can stay out of works by remembering how good God is. When you are tempted to do it on your own, stop, begin to rehearse how good God has been to you, and begin to praise Him. That will get you out of works, and it will keep you in faith, and it will keep you in grace. Just remember how good He's been to you. Remember, recount the blessings. Think about His faithfulness to you. Think about all the times He's answered your prayers. It is time to stop working for it. It's time to start praising Him for it. It is time to stop working for it. It's time to start praising Him for it. We're not going to get this on your ability or mine. We're going to get it by the grace of God. Brothers and sisters, it's not how big, it's not how, how big your problem, it's how big God's grace is. The size of your problem doesn't matter when you compare it to how much grace God has. I need to slow down a little bit, don't I? I know you guys are hungry for teaching on grace. I can feel when I'm ministering on this that you guys are drawing things out of me and you're hungry for this, and I'm glad. Sometimes we get impatient and we think we're going to hurry God along. And, well, God, I'm going to step out and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to brainstorm. I love a, a story from Jesse the Planets. He came up with a great idea. He said, God, I got this idea. He said, we're going to do a commercial on every single station all across America at one time. And he, he has the money to do that kind of stuff. He said, we're going to do one commercial every channel at the exact same time. And God says, Jesse, that's a good idea. We're not going to do it, but that's a good idea. <laughs> How many good ideas do we have? And God says, that's a good idea, but we're not doing that. Right? We're trying to work it out, make, making it happen on our own. That's the opposite of grace. So when you get tempted to hurry God along, stop, praise Him, remember how good He's been. Amen? Amen. Remember, it's not the size of your problem, it's the size of His grace. Well, that's a good one. It's not the size of your problem, it's the size of His grace. How many here has ever taken the time to think about Seven billion people on this planet. And God has to deal with all of them at one time. How many people are messing up right now? How many people are struggling right now? How many people are crying out to God right now? How many people are living in victory right now? How many people are getting closer to God right now? How many people are turning away from God right now? All of that stuff God has to deal with every single moment. And he's got the grace for everybody. That's a lot of grace, isn't it? We think our family is going to drive us nuts. <laughs> he's got 7 billion people, and a lot of them don't want anything to do with him. But he's gracious anyway. Amen. Hallelujah. Look at Romans chapter 4, please. Romans 4, verse 16. We know real well. We're going to read it twice real slow. I've got a good nugget for you right here. I'm going to ask you to write down in a moment. Romans 4, 16. Are you there? <clears throat> no? Okay. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace 
To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. One more time. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. I'm going to ask you to write this down. Grace is powerful enough to change the world. Grace is powerful enough to change the world. And grace is powerful enough to change the world and personable enough to shape a life. Grace is powerful enough to change the world and personable enough to shape a life. I think that's a good statement about grace. Grace is powerful enough to change the world and personable enough to shape a life. God's grace shaped Abraham and Sarah's lives into what he had in mind for them. I want you to think about our, our parents here for a moment in the faith, Abraham and Sarah. God's grace moved in on that couple and His grace shaped, it shaped, it molded their life. His grace put their lives on a different course, on a different destiny. Their lives were shaped by His grace. He took an old man and an old woman who was barren her whole life and He said, I'm going to change your names, give you a new identity, give you a new destiny and I'm going to do it not because you deserved it or earned it but because of my grace. I, I'm, I've been captivated the last couple of days with this phrase, a life shaped by grace. And that's the title of the message, a life shaped by grace. God wants to shape your life by His grace. And I got Holy Ghost bumps all up and down me when I just said that, hallelujah. God wants to shape your life by His grace. It's God's grace that provides for you. It's God's grace that provided for Abraham and Sarah. It's God's grace that provides for you and me. No matter what the need, God's grace provides it. Amen? A life shaped by grace. I was thinking about that phrase that God gave me, and I saw a tombstone. I thought, what a great thing to put on somebody's epitaph or on their tombstone is a life shaped by grace. Man, I would like that on my tombstone. The only problem with that is Leanne and I are holding out for the rapture, and we're going to go together. So, and I'm praying that the Holy Ghost leads me like 10, 15 seconds before the rapture, that I hold her in my arms and I give her a kiss. One of those real long, drawn-out, romantic kisses, you know, like the kind that most of us our age have, hasn't had in decades. So we're, I'm kissing her, and then the horn blows, and we shoot up through the air, and I'm holding her hands, and I'm going, yeah, that's the best kiss you ever had. You were raptured out of that kiss. That's what I'm praying for. And, <laughs> and then, yeah, and then for the last time, she'll be able to say this to me as we're going through the clouds. She'll say, Phil, you're such a dork. And then that's, that's it. She'll never be able to say that again. So that's my prayer. You can agree with me in prayer. So I won't have a tombstone that says his life is shaped by grace. But I'll get a good kiss before we go up. Hallelujah. All right. So we're here at Romans 4, 16. Hold your place. We're going to read this verse again, but go with me to Romans eleven six. 6. We'll read Romans eleven six 6 and Romans 4, 16. Romans eleven six. 6. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. One more time. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. 
But if it is of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Grace is the reason faith is so important. Grace is the reason faith is so important. Grace is the reason faith is so important. It's the key to why it's impossible to please God without it. If you do not live by faith, then God cannot treat you with His grace. If you do not live by faith, then God cannot treat you with His grace. This is why faith is so important. We've got a choice. We can either try to do it by the works of the flesh, by our own strength and ability, or we can forego that and live by faith and let God treat us with His grace. The reason why it's impossible to please God without faith is because without faith, He can't give you His grace. Because in your works, well, God, I'm a self-made man. We've talked about that. I'm a self-made man. God, I can do it. God, I don't need your help. And he's like, really? You realize your next breath is coming from me? And you think you can do this? I, if we would meditate for just a little, a little bit about how it must seem to God, your works aren't going to impress him very much. And it's really, in one sense... Trying to work to deserve the things of God is like slapping God in the face. And what you're saying to the Lord is, well, I know what Jesus did, but it's not enough. I've got to do something. I know Jesus went to the whipping post and by his stripes I'm healed, but I've got to do something. It really wasn't enough. That's a slap in the face of God. Amen. Our works are not enough. They will never be enough. It is by faith and it's by grace. That's the plan of redemption. And if you want to be a friend of God and you want to get real close to Him, you're going to have to abandon your works and get a hold of faith and grace. We frustrate His heart when we try to do it on our own as opposed to trusting Him for the grace. Amen. Grace is God treating you like He wants to and not as you deserve. Grace is God treating you like He wants to and not as you deserve. You can really tell where people are. You can locate them by their words. People will say, I just don't deserve. I just don't deserve. So in other words, your mind's not renewed to grace yet. Because it's obvious to all of us that no, none of us deserve it. I suggest that you do not go to God in prayer and give him your list of all of your accomplishments. God, look at my Sunday school quarterly. Look at all the stars. I, I memorized my memory verse. I, I brought someone to, to church. I brought my Bible. God, I haven't cussed or kicked the cat in three days. I suggest you don't give him your resume. His resume is better than yours. If you really want something from God, tell him about Jesus' resume, not your resume. Right? Tell him about the Lord's resume. What Jesus did, his works, his accomplishments are so much greater than ours. Amen. Right? Hallelujah. Please say this after me. I live by faith. I live by faith. So I live by grace. I live by faith. So I live by grace. Faith connects you to the grace of God. Faith connects you to the grace of God. It is the grace connector. We teach a lot of, on faith, and we want our faith to grow. Try to, try to imagine this in your mind. The bigger your, your faith grows, the more God's grace can come into you. The bigger your faith, the more God's grace can come into you. The bigger your faith, the more God's grace can come into you. 
You guys, I, I wish that we could have a time portal and go back to when I was like 14, 15 and watch my life and listen to me because I was so trying to be perfect. I wanted to deserve and earn everything that God had for me and I thought I had to be just perfect to be this minister and none of that was true. It's His grace. Right? If a person was born and if they could live their whole life perfect, never cuss, never have a bad thought, made sure all their motives were pure, and they lived a perfect, sinless life, they still could not get to heaven. Because you can only come one way, and that's through Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He, there's no plan B. Right? God desires to shape your life by grace. Our father and our mother in the faith, Abraham and Sarah, are the primo examples for us. Romans 4, verse 11. Wait, before we go there. Therefore it is of faith that it might be grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. To the end the promise might be sure. This is uh, Romans 4.16. I didn't go to four, Romans 4.11 yet. So Romans 4.16. The promises of God are just as sure in your life as they were with Abraham and Sarah. The promises of God are just as sure in your life as they were to Joshua, Moses, or any other great person that we are heroes in the Bible. The, the promises of God are just as sure to you. Why? Because it's by His grace, not by your works. I was talking to a brother last week, and he was saying to me, he was, we were talking about all the, the heroes in the Bible, and he said not one of them was perfect. He said all of the star boys he had on the team, his dream team, they all messed up. Adultery, murderers, liars, full of fear, run and hide, his best people. And that was put in there to let us know that it's his grace. Amen? Amen? All right, so therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure. God's promises to you are just as sure as they were to anybody else in the Bible. His grace is just as sure for you as it was for them. Okay, verse 11, Romans 4, 11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. One day I was reading this back a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and a part of this verse just really stood out at me that I had never seen before, and that's the first part of verse 11. And he received this sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. And so I read it again, and what came out to me was, and he received the sign, skip circumcision for a moment, he received the sign, a seal of the righteousness of the faith. He received a sign, and that sign was a seal. God gave Abraham a sign, and that sign was a seal of the righteousness of, that he had between him and God, and it was a seal of his faith. You follow me so far? Yeah. Okay. Sign, signs, signs and seal. Kept coming to me. Signs and seal, sign and seal, sign and seal. Now, before we get into this, and I give you some details. Man. Lord, I hope they get this. God, if you ask him, if you desire... God will give you a sign as a seal of your faith in Him. God will give you a sign. It'll be something personal between you and Him. God will give you a sign, and that sign is a seal proving your faith in Him. Does that interest anybody in the house? That God will give you a sign as a seal of your faith in Him. 
before you just jump out and pray it, make it a good one. Make it a good one. He received the sign, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. All right, please write this down for me. God bless you. Signs, sign, a sign is something to represent and instruct. A sign is something to represent and instruct. A sign is something to represent and instruct. It's a sign of absolute grace and favor. It is a sign of absolute grace and favor. This deals with grace. We'll get to it here. So let's look at Abraham. When God gave Abraham the sign of circumcision, that sign was to represent something and that sign was an instruction. All right? So for us, the people of God, we know that we're circumcised in our heart. That was the natural. We've got the spiritual. All right? So that sign of circumcision represented that God's people would be sanctified or separated unto Him. We're not going to be general. We're not going to be among the population and be like everybody else. We're going to be a different kind of people because the flesh life has been removed from us. Okay? So it represents, but also it instructs. When we, when we study on circumcision of heart and we look at Abraham and all, all that happened uh, with, with Joshua and the hill of Gilgal, I was reading that the other day. I was really going through Joshua captivated. Let me th- take this real quick. The children of Israel went through the, the, through, uh, the desert. The old people died out because of their unbelief. So you got a new generation. And so God commands Joshua. He says, take the men and circumcise them, and it's called Gilgal, the hill of the foreskin. God made this statement to him. He said, I have removed, or I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt. That is so, that speaks volumes to me. I have removed away the reproach of Egypt upon you. When we are sanctified, when the flesh life is removed from us, and we're separated unto God, the reproach, the reproach, the shame, the, all that stuff that comes with failing has been removed. We're righteous. Right? So a sign, the sign of circumcision to represent, to instruct of absolute grace and favor. Now, seal. Seal to ratify and confirm. Seal to ratify and confirm. And that's what it did with Abraham. It ratified and confirmed his faith in God. To ratify and confirm... In general, it was a seal of the covenant of grace, which is called the righteousness, which is of faith. The righteousness, which is of faith. That's a long sentence, isn't it? The righteousness, which is of faith. What in the world does that mean? It means that you are right in God's eyes by faith. Because you put faith in Jesus, you're right in His sight. That's the covenant of grace. He received the sign, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. He received the sign being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. That's you and I, right? I believe in my heart that right now God's dealing with some people and stirring them up about a sign and a seal. God wants to give you a sign and He wants to seal your relationship with Him, your faith with Him. And once you receive this sign, people are going to go and they're going to close their mouth and they're going to stop talking about you because this is God. He has done, proven publicly that you are His child and they dare not speak a word against you. Amen? What an honor. What, a, what a, a privilege for God to give you a sign that seals your faith in Him. I've been meditating on Leviticus 26.9 and it says this. This is the first part of the verse. For I will have respect unto you. For I will have respect unto you 
and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. Can you imagine God saying, I respect you. Wow. We don't think in those terms. We don't talk, we always talk about being unworthy and no good. And God publicly says, I respect you. We're throwing out God's no respecter of persons. And that's just one side of the coin. The other side is, for I will have respect unto you. That's what God did with Abraham here. He respected him and gave him a sign that was a seal. And it, it solidified that this is a covenant of grace between you and I. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. As we close, let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, please. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus. I want to remind you that grace is the power to live the truth, right? Truth without grace produces law. Truth without grace produces law. I've heard preachers say, I just give them the truth. That's not enough. It's not enough to give people truth. Truth without grace produces law. Grace and truth gives us life and light. Grace and truth gives us life and light. And that's exactly what we need, brothers and sisters. Truth without grace produces law. Grace and truth gives us life and light. Truth without grace produces law. Grace and truth gives us light, gives us life and light. I got one, one more for you. Preach truth, but impart grace. Preach truth, but impart grace. Everybody needs truth, but everybody needs grace. Preach truth, but impart grace. We hurt people by giving them truth and not giving them grace. We drive people away. The very, the, the very opposite of what we're trying to do, we drive people away because we're not giving them grace. We're not giving them space to make mistakes, to grow, to develop, to develop. Uh, I've been spending some time with, with uh, Brother Christian, and we were talking about some things, and he mentioned about somebody being, well, somebody's 15 years into this, and I said, yeah, and you're not even 15 months into it. He's not, not even a full year into the things of God. So God gives him grace. He's growing. He's learning. And along the way, he's going to make mistakes because we have too. And we're, we still will as we learn and grow. So God gives us truth, but he gives us grace. He gives us the ability to make mistakes. Oh, he's not going to fall off the throne. And he, he imparts the grace to get up, get, clean up our knees, and step out and try it again. Amen? Amen? Listen to me carefully. God would rather you try to step out in faith and fail a hundred times than not try at all. This is so important. He would rather you step out 100 times in faith and fail every single time than not try at all. Because on the 101st time, the devil's going to run into you and you're going to clean his clock. It honors him when we step out and we learn and we try. Amen? Amen? The devil has said to people, don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. You're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to look like a fool. What do you think you're doing? He doesn't want you to take that step of faith because that step of faith is a step of grace. 
preach truth, but impart grace. I'm looking at sister here on the second row. How many times have you seen people pushed out, pushed away by truth, but no grace? Too many times to count. And you're all those years at the bookstore, right? Too many times to count. People meant well, but there was no grace with it. Listen to me carefully. Everybody needs truth, but everybody needs grace. Truth, grace come through Jesus. I am so thankful for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening today and being a part. We appreciate it so much. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words, be not afraid, only believe.